Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jose Leon. I am the Chief Medical Officer for the National Center for Health and Public Housing. And thank you for uh, participating in our uh, session number four of this learning collaborative, Expanding Diabetes Prevention and Management Through Health Center Outreach. It's such a great pleasure to uh, have you, all, uh, to have all of you. It's my understanding that we have a very, just a uh, few uh, participants today uh, with all the COVID-19 activities and vaccination uh, campaigns and everything uh, that has impacted the number of participants uh, for um, all training sessions, not only for the National Center for Health and Public Housing, but all uh, organizations providing training to health centers uh, and health center staff members. So thank you for making some time out of your busy schedule to participate today um, and discuss uh, the uh, diabetes prevention and activities and strategies that you have in place. Um, today, we are going to discuss a little bit about uh, virtual visits and the uh, technology and what is coming, what, what, is, uh, uh, what is coming. Uh, um, there are several challenges, COVID-19, <clears throat> Uh, has been like a turning point for for healthcare and preventive uh, uh, services for public health and uh, for health centers in general. So uh, this is a very good opportunity to briefly discuss what the challenges will be in the future and how uh, we will have to adapt to these challenges. Next slide. So this is a live session. Um, since we are just a few uh, participating, a few people participating, uh, if you can engage in chat, or if you have your camera on, if you uh, would like to ask any questions or, or, or provide any best practices, uh, it would be such a great opportunity to uh, exchange information with all of you. Um, this uh, is a live event uh, on the resources will be sent to all of you uh, within a week after this session. Next slide. If uh, you would like to get resources uh, uh, for this uh, from uh, 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 for this learning collaborative, you can go to Moodle. If you haven't created any account, uh, you can go to moodle.nchpa.org and choose expanding diabetes prevention and management. And then you will have access to all the resources that we've been sharing, including the slides, the uh, 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 fact sheets or whatever we've been uh, discussing and, and, and the uh, recording and everything that you need to go over uh, the, the activities and what we have discussed so far uh, during this learning collaborative. Next slide. So the uh, National Center for Health and Public Housing is funded by HERSA to provide training and technical assistance to health centers. Uh, we are specialized in, in uh, health centers serving public housing residents. However, all the recommendations on diabetes management and diabetes prevention are about the same for all uh, special and vulnerable populations. So we can, um, even if you are not serving public housing residents, uh, you can adapt any of the strategies for the uh, vulnerable and underserved populations that you serve. Next slide. So uh, next slide. Okay. Just as a quick reminder, um, in 2019, there were uh, 433 health centers near a public housing development, and they serve over 5 million patients. Um, the, uh, out of the 433, 108 uh, are public housing primary care grantees. Uh, that means that they receive funding from HRSA to uh, provide uh, services to public housing residents, and they serve over uh, 800,000 patients uh, in 2019. Next slide. We've been discussing uh, uh, demographics and social determinants of health affecting public housing residents. Uh, we've been uh, talking about uh, health literacy. We've been talking about um, um, 
those uh, being affected by diabetes, uh, specifically uh, minor minority groups. And uh, today we are going to briefly, briefly discuss um, the uh, needs to serve the elderly. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, around 35% of those living in public housing are over the age of 62. And that's the uh, age group that is of, uh, 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 generally, there are some changes because uh, we tend to say 65 and older, but for HUD is 62 and older. So uh, uh, that's the reason we have uh, that a percentage of those living in public housing. And those are the ones who are prioritized when um, they uh, receive all the uh, applications for, from people to live in public housing. Next slide. Just as a quick reminder, uh, diabetes continues to be a big issue um, in the United States and uh, in the world. Uh, these are numbers, again, from uh, the 2019 UDS data. And um, in public housing, uh, we have 9.6% uh, of those living in public housing with uh, diabetes. And, though, and around 32% of them are uh, or have uncontrolled diabetes which uh, for her says and, um, and CMS purposes is uh, diabetes or, or, or an A1C greater than nine. Next slide. So we are going to start uh, our discussion today. This is the CSWs of the future, virtual business and technology. We know that uh, you uh, have been working with patients and you know that how COVID has changed the um, the way that we are uh, interacting with our patients now. Uh, now, it seems that telemedicine will be the tool that we, ever, that we will be using to uh, reach out to patients. And uh, there are other technologies and gadgets that we need to learn, uh, that we need to make sure that we are familiar with and learn how to use them so we can help patients with diabetes. Uh, um, so uh, there is a really nice video that I would like to share with you, uh, specifically on how uh, public health is changing and, and primary care is changing. So next slide, Kide. And this is uh, these are going to be some of the uh, issues that we are planning to discuss. Uh, discuss the 21st century healthcare challenges. Describe. The differences uh, or the difference between telehealth and telemedicine, list virtual diabetes prevention intervention, engage in CSWs, and identify diabetes prevention promising practices through virtual visits. Next slide. So let's take a look at this video for a moment uh, so we have a better uh, idea of what we are planning to discuss today. Um, just to confirm, can you all hear the video? No, we cannot hear the video. Okay. Um, Before their day even starts, they are. Now, now we, we, we we're able to hear. This is Maria and her partner, Ruben. Before their day even starts, they are providing a detailed snapshot. You got me muted, Fide. Sorry about the technical uh, difficulties here. I'm not sure whether this is something that we can play, otherwise we can move on. Okay, it's not playing the sound anymore? No, it's not. Um, I'll share the link through the chat, okay? That way you guys can watch it at a later time.
All right. Uh, can you go back for a moment? Well, uh, our apologies, and that's the reason why we have to make sure that we <laughs> we are uh, uh, familiar with technology, and <laughs> that's exactly what we are planning to discuss today, and how uh, we can help patients and. Uh, um, um, and to be more familiar with all, all technology, we are changing. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, healthcare is going to change. Preventive services will change, and we're not talking about twenty years from now. We're talking about probably two or three years from now. So we need to make sure that we understand technology, that we make sure that we are, um, uh, receive all the train, all the training needed to address all these issues. So before uh, we move on. Um, I would just uh, I would like to stop for a moment and just ask, uh, and if you can either uh, uh, use the chat box, or uh, if, or if you would like to verbally uh, discuss this issue, what are the challenges that you see that will happen in the future uh, in regards to um, chronic diseases, for instance? What what are you foreseeing? What what do you think is going to be the next challenges. So far, we have a pandemic. We've been discussing that diabetes is a priority and a big issue, you know, uh, not only in the United States, but every, everywhere. So um, since we are discussing the future of health, what do you think will be the conditions that we need to pay attention to in the next few years? Anyone who would like to chime in? All right, let, let's let's review a couple of uh, challenges. Uh, see the next slide. WHO, the World Health Organization has uh, information on, on some publications on what the new challenges will be in the future. Uh, one of them is the healthcare for the aging population. Now that with uh, technology and new medications and uh, innovative services, uh, we are living and we are getting, uh, you know, uh, over the, the the life expectancy is 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 changing so um in the united states for instance by 2060 uh the uh population over 60 is expected to double so what does it mean for us uh how what how what impact uh we will have uh, you know for for a population who is getting or who is living longer as you know, uh, people with uh, 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 people over the age of over the age of sixty five have more issues understanding technology, for instance. So we need to make sure that we address all uh, all all those needs. Uh, um, if you talk to or based on your experience, when you discuss uh, technology or you have to have a, a Zoom meeting, for instance, with uh, patients over the age of 65, they have more problems and issues uh, uh, trying to understand technology and have that uh, virtual interaction with the health centers. So that's gonna be a challenge, as well as uh, the um, ability to, to discuss with patients multiple uh, new technology and applications. Uh, so we need to make sure that we are, uh, we are, uh, understanding all the changes and the new technology and the new apps that we we, we, uh, we, we are going to discuss some of them uh, during the session but uh, this is going to be a challenge we have a population who is living longer and we need to make sure that we address uh, the issues that not only the healthcare issues but the preventive services that we are going to offer to this population next slide 
WHO also uh, mentioned climate change. That's going to be another issue uh, that we have that we have to address. And climate change is going to uh, increase some of uh, the prevalence or, or the incidence of some conditions. Uh, for instance, asthma. Uh, we will have probably more people with asthma, and, and we need to make sure that we that we address those issues and we start talking to our patients about uh, climate change. In addition to that, uh, 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 skin cancer, for instance, will be another issue. Uh, I mean, uh, as long as uh, um, if if people are exposed to uh, to the sun and, and and with all these changes uh, in, in the climate uh, in the climate. That that's going to affect how patients, you know, are going to uh, look for new ways to improve or to prevent skin cancer. The uh, other issues uh, with climate change is going to be that we are going to have more drought and for the scarcity and increase in extreme weather that will cause injuries and death. So uh, we need to make sure that we have uh, that we that we have an emergency plan in place, and how we can um, help patients who already have issues accessing healthy food in, in the future. Where if they will have uh, um, a uh, according to the scientists, and this is an U, uh, UN uh, estimate, is that if the temperature goes above 1.5 degrees celsius then we are going to have all these issues affecting our populations uh, next slide and then uh, this is another big issue and is the fact that since we are living longer we are going to have uh, comorbidities so we are not talking only about diabetes we're talking about hypertension cardiovascular diseases, kidney diseases, um, and all the uh, other comorbidities that people will have in the future. Even though we are making progress uh, with uh, medications, we are still uh, have um, people who are not following preventive services. And preventive services will be needed to address all these uh, uh, comorbidities in the future, because uh, otherwise we will be just uh, treating patients without uh, providing any preventive services that at the end um, will help patients not to be, uh, not, not to have all these comorbidities. So uh, that is uh, the reason why we need to pay attention to, to, um, to uh, uh, multi-morbidity. So uh, patient will be, will, will be more, uh, uh, will, will experience more uh, chronic uh, medical conditions. Uh, next slide, Peter. And then uh, the other one is uh, mental health. We already have an epidemic. We already have a, 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 an initiative and, and HRSA has a priority on, on mental health. But in the future, mental health will increase uh, uh, the incidence and prevalence of anxiety, depression, and other mental health illnesses will increase. And we need to make sure that we start addressing all these issues and, and work with uh, our, the healthcare team to, to plan for the future. So um, those are the main concerns according to the, to the World Health Organizations about what will be the challenges in, in the future. Next slide. So before we uh, discuss our case study for today, there are other um, issues that we are going to experience and, and is in addition to um, to to uh, chronic diseases we also need to pay attention to uh, communicable diseases uh, we already have a COVID-19 pandemic now uh, since we people are traveling and you can be in the United States right now and if you take a plane you can be in Europe in six to eight hours, depending on where you are going. So the ability for us to transmit new pathogens or new conditions will be, or, or new uh, uh, infections, uh, that's the way how COVID-19 has spread uh, so quickly. 
So we also need to pay attention to uh, communicable diseases and immunization in the future will be another big tool that we need to keep in mind. And at the same time, we need to make sure that we address all the vaccine hesitancy that we are having so far. So uh, those are the, the concerns that we have. Uh, so uh, we've been dealing with not only non-communicable diseases, but communicable diseases. And the big, big issue is funding. You know, how we are going to get funding to address all these issues, because uh, uh, we have, we, we've been discussing uh, what is going to probably will happen in the future, what the challenges will be. But we also need to make sure that we, in addition to get the training that we need, we also need to make sure that we have a funding to address all these issues with uh, our uh, uh, affecting our populations. Since uh, our session for today is diabetes, um, we are going to discuss uh, later on this case study, but uh, just this is just a brief overview of what we are planning to discuss today. And Ms. Garcia is an 89-year-old widow who has difficulties communicating in English. She's been living in public housing with one of her granddaughters for the past two years because her family have been unable to cope with her nursing needs following a stroke in 2012, which has affected the right side and her speech. Ms. Garcia is unable to manage the normal activities of daily living. She was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes 20 years ago. Ms. Garcia had taken a great interest in her diabetes when she was able to, but since having a stroke and a death of her spouse in 2013, she has not been able to participate in her own personal and diabetes care. Over time, Ms. Garcia has become increasing, increasingly frustrated because she's unable to communicate how she's feeling or what her needs are. This week, you are going to communicate with Ms. Garcia virtually via Zoom, and you are preparing to make sure you provide an effective diabetes care management and support. Next slide. So uh, we need to make sure that we understand two, uh, two concepts that we generally use interchangeably, but uh, they are a little bit different. Uh, or different. Uh, one is the uh, telemedicine and the other one is telehealth. Um, telemedicine is the practice of medicine using technology to deliver care at a distance. A physician in one location uses a tele telecommunications infrastructure to deliver care to a patient at a distant site. Whereas uh, telehealth is or refers to broadly to electronic uh, and, telecommunica and telecommunications technologies and services used to provide care and service at a distance. So next slide. So for purposes, um, if you are if you are providing outreach, if you are going to talk to patients about prevention, about nutrition, about uh, 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 exercise, an exercise routine, we are we are talking about telehealth. Telemedicine is more the interaction of uh, clinicians with patients, and and but all ser all other services, um, specifically uh, preventive services, are more related to telehealth. So. Um, that is the main difference between telehealth and telemedicine. Um, uh, we use it interchangeably, uh, definitely, but uh, there is a, 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 a huge difference between the two, term, the two terms. Uh, next slide. So uh, we've been discussing about uh, virtual care and how uh, COVID-19 has changed. The way that we are communicating with patients, uh, we are providing more uh, virtual services. Uh, patients were afraid of, of going or coming to our clinics. Um, so we had to uh, make sure that they were following all the uh, instructions and uh, addressing the social determinants of health affecting uh, our patients. So uh, as a result, uh, COVID has been like a turning point in, uh, on a specific, uh, and will be, you know, from now on, the, somehow the way that we are going to communicate with patients. Uh, in the past, we were using uh, telemedicine uh, or virtual care 
uh, just for uh, some kind of conditions like um, uh, mental health, mental health, for instance, and, and addressing all the uh, issues regarding mental health. Uh, but now with uh, COVID, uh, we have found, uh, and patients have found that they can also use technology to communicate with, uh, with our health centers and our, on, on our people working at clinical sites so they can receive not only uh, management but preventive services. Next slide. So uh, there are some benefits of virtual health. Um, this is in regards to uh, any epidemic. Uh, right now we can say, oh, okay, this is the, it's COVID, but uh, as we've been discussing, uh, we have mentioned, we can have other uh, uh, communicable diseases in the future. I mean, uh, we have, uh, for instance, uh, an outbreak of Ebola. Uh, we were very concerned about Ebola. Uh, we also had some uh, mosquito transmitted diseases like uh, uh, Zika virus infection. So um, this is, uh, this is a, a, a how all these uh, infectious diseases and the, uh, uh, any epidemic or any pandemic can change how we are communicating with patients. The next slide. So uh, the first one, and let's uh, focus on diabetes specifically, is uh, consistent monitoring. Now patients with uh, getting uh, telehealth services uh, you can check the uh, blood glucose. Uh, patients usually have the, uh, the uh, glucometers uh, and you can just make sure that they are able to read, uh, that they, the readings are, are what you are expecting from them. So there is, a, a, you have a patient who doesn't need like uh, to go to the clinic and probably wait for a few weeks to get an appointment. Now with uh, technology, uh, patients can have access to a uh, clinic easily and at the same time uh, uh, have a, a, a very in, a good interaction with uh, the, the healthcare team. Also, um, you can uh, take a look at uh, lifestyle modifications and whether or not the patient with uh, diabetes is exercising, whether the patient with diabetes has increase or has uh, uh, has gained some weight, um, whether the patient has experienced either hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. So those are the, the, uh, the uh, topics that you can discuss with your patients and at the same time, making sure that if there is any issue that you can address that issue through telehealth. Then um, you have a patient and family engagement. That's another uh, another big uh, benefit. Uh, when you have a patient with diabetes, it's extremely necessary to have interaction with family members as well. And um, through telemedicine, this is easier to do. Uh, sometimes you can have a, a patient in your clinic, but uh, the patient doesn't go with, uh, with a family member. And somehow there is a family member involved in the uh, preparing food for the patients, you know, and they need to make sure that they understand, they also understand how diabetes is impacting and how food, uh, the, what they are, uh, your diabetic patient are eating are impacting their diabetes uh, outcome. Then um, patients with diabetes also have uh, uh, some mental health disorders like uh, depression. So the, through telehealth, you are able to uh, screen for, for depression or for any other uh, issue affecting patients, anxiety, depression, or, or, or sometimes people have issues, you know, and cannot sleep well at night. So these are some of the benefits of, 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 of telehealth. Uh, you can also have some uh, preventive, uh, preventive programs, uh, specifically, uh, some uh, health centers are offering uh, yoga classes or they are offering Zumba uh, uh, um, and through uh, virtual platforms. So this is another way to, to, to reach out to your patients. 
and then cost control. Uh, this is uh, probably the uh, concern is whether or not uh, or some of the services that we are offering to our patients will be uh, reimbursable. But uh, at this moment, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, most of the services that we are providing are reimbursable. Uh, you can get some reimbursement from from e uh, either the insurance companies or the or CMS, Medicare or Medicaid, and uh, uh, that's that's uh, something that probably will remain and we will have to consider when we offer uh, uh, telehealth services to our patients with diabetes. Next slide. There are some uh, examples and some best practices in regards to uh, how uh, health centers in general are using uh, uh, telemedicine. Uh, this one in particular is the Catalina Island Telemedicine Center. Is uh, They have a residents uh, of Santa Catalina Island uh, located in the coast of California to access specialty care electronically. And some telemedicine services offer include diabetic education and eye screenings to help residents see a special providers. The telemedicine center partnered with Loma Linda University Medical Center, the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health, and a private psychiatry uh, company. There are other organizations that we've been talking to and other health centers, and sometimes they offer uh, telemedicine services for patients with hepatitis. Uh, there is one in particular offering uh, hepatitis C uh, um, uh, consultation with a specialist for those patients with uh, uh, hepatitis C that probably go to the clinic and they need to see a specialist. So these are um, some of the uh, ex uh, examples on how health centers are using telehealth. Now, the other one that I would like to briefly mention is the Project ECHO. Uh, ECHO is the uh, an evidence-based program for managing uh, complex uh, conditions and uh, for chws of outreach or, or, or patient coordinators there are some really good trainings if you do a google search and type project echo for instance diabetes uh, there is one in particular where you can get a uh, training and uh, uh, you can also submit questions. You can also uh, share uh, any experience or any challenges that you were having with patients. So this is extremely important because it's not only about the patient, but about how we are going to get training in the future. Uh, we've been talking that patients will have access to virtual visits, but at the same time, we are able through technology to receive training. Uh, uh, virtual training and, and, and communicate with other health centers or other clinics experiencing the same challenges that uh, you are experiencing. Next slide. So, um, in a bit, and, and this is not something that, uh, or a topic that I, I am just discussing and, and NCHPH is saying, oh, this is what is going to happen. There are some studies, and this is just an example of how research is being conducted and how uh, through telemedicine training, uh, community healthcare workers can improve their knowledge on diabetes. And there are uh, studies on, uh, on if you go to, to the National Library of Medicine and type diabetes on, on community health workers, you will find a lot of uh, research uh, that is being performed, uh, basically uh, saying how uh, community healthcare workers can help in improving uh, diabetes uh, um, outcomes in, in, in our patient. And at the same time, how by, by improving your knowledge uh, in diabetes, you can help your patients with uh, preventive services. Next slide. So uh, there are several things that uh, um, that we can do through virtual visits and uh, specifically in regards to how we can communicate with patients. Uh, one of them is um, 
reduce the risk factors. If we have communication with your with our patients, uh, I mean, we, we do the uh, the, uh, the the visits either through uh, the clinic or we go to the communities. And, but at this at this moment, uh, you can also address uh, social determinants of health issues with your patients. You can discuss insurance um, problems. You can discuss whether or not the patient is receiving the um, the treatment that they need. Whether the patients uh, are getting enough exercise. Uh, uh, this is uh, something personal, but uh, 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 this is my my own opinion. But um, the pandemic is making people uh, less active. Uh, we tend to sit for uh, longer hours in uh, in front of computers or doing, or because we are afraid of going out. People are not exercising enough, and then uh, uh, people are uh, somehow gaining weight and and. and and this is something that we can discuss with our patients, and we can offer uh, extra, uh, some exercise routines through uh, telemedicine, for instance. The other is uh, you can also conduct group sessions. Um, uh, it's not only to have a conversation with one patient, but you can have uh, all these uh, 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 prevention programs and, and and through technology like the one that we're using right now, Zoom, you can have uh, access to multiple patients and discuss and have focus group on different uh, issues and different challenges that they have to address their diabetes. Then uh, uh, you can also provide education and other interventions that, uh, that you can do in uh, uh, community-based uh, settings that, that you, you used to do at community-based uh, settings. Now you can do it through uh, telemedic uh, through um, uh, Zoom or any other uh, platform that you're using to communicate with patients. Next slide. So there are different ways how we are communicating with patients. I know that uh, probably you are using more than one, but uh, so far uh, we are communicating with patients either through text messaging uh, we are using some apps. Uh, patients have uh, different apps where they can check their their uh, exercise needs, their nutrition needs. Or if you are talking to a patient and the patient needs some resources, you can refer the patient to a website. Uh, during our first session, we discussed some of the uh, American Diabetes Association resources for patients with diabetes and. Um, on, on some fact sheets and infographics that they can use. Uh, the simplest that we are using is just to have a conversation over the phone. And probably you can say that this is not like a, like a big technology, but still it's something that we do and we address, uh, or we, that we use to address some of the needs of our patients uh, or video calls or the use of uh, virtual technology uh, and multiple technologies. I mean, you can have conversations with your patient. At the same time, you can use your, uh, your, um, your patient portal to communicate and send information. So uh, this is going to be how in the future, uh, we are using it now, but it's going to be more uh, prevalent um, in the future on how we are going to communicate with patients through uh, technology and electronic devices. Next slide. Uh, this is just an example of a health app. Uh, this is a very popular one that people are using. And this is the health and nutrition guide and fitness, fitness calculator. Uh, you, you have a smartphone, an iPhone, or, or any of the smartphones. You can download the application, and you can check um, whether or not you are doing uh, enough exercise or whether you are getting the nutrients that you need. Uh, specifically, if you have a chronic condition, and you can uh, you can pers personalize the information and and add all the uh, uh, all the uh, comorbidities if you have more than one uh, um, chronic condition, or if you are planning to add uh, any other uh, issues with a uh, health issue, and then uh, you can have uh, some 
some results and some uh, estimates on what you need to do to address uh, your, your, your health needs. Next slide. So this is what uh, I was discussing, discussing previously. This is a project echo um, example. Um, basically, uh, this is if you are part of a project echo and you are communicating with other health centers or with other clinics, you can uh, fill this uh, information out and have uh, the um, information about your patient uh, or everything that you would like to discuss with other health centers and get some uh, some best practices from other or advice so you can address the healthcare needs of your patient with diabetes. Next slide. Uh, this is something uh, that uh, uh, I was doing some research on the health center info uh, and this is a best practice from one of the uh, uh, on-site uh, on um, uh, on um, visits that you have uh, from HRSA. And what they are doing is that they are collecting uh, some best practices to share with uh, other health centers. If you are interested, you can go to healthcenterinfo.org and there is a section on best practices. And if you select diabetes, you can find some best practices that you, uh, based on what you're doing or, or then what your needs are, you can implement or adapt. But this is a health center uh, in uh, Alaska. And this is a nonprofit organization providing services to rural uh, people in Alaska. And what they are doing is that uh, they have a system of care, a customer-driven relationship based health system, and they are training uh, uh, health educators and outreach workers to to go to this to go to these rural uh, and remote areas in Alaska that you can either access through plane or through a snowmobile, based on, on the uh, on the weather conditions and then have some interaction with patients and educate patients. And at the same time, use the, tele, uh, the telehealth services to communicate with the specialist if the patient needs to see a specialist. Next, next slide. So uh, they are using uh, their electronic health records. Basically what they do is that they get all the information from that community uh, what the uh, medication that the patient is on, uh, uh, everything related to the UDS data, uh, uh, um, what the needs of this community is. And then they, they use what they call community health aids uh, uh, program. And they train, pay, uh, they, they train uh, either outreach workers or some students uh, and provide them with basic knowledge on diabetes so they can discuss with patients uh, some of the challenges that the patients may be experiencing. And if they see that there is any issue, and since these are remote areas, what they do is that they also schedule some uh, virtual session with, with patients. Uh, so patients can have access to a specialist or to the uh, doctor. And if the clinic cannot, cannot provide the services, then the clinic also has communication with some uh, hospitals and some specialty uh, um, uh, people to, to make sure that the patient gets all the information and all the health services that they need. Next slide. So um, this is the same uh, case study and how you can uh, implement uh, the what they are doing, but basically you need to get some information from, from your uh, electronic health records about the needs of your patients, identify your patient with diabetes and what, uh, what of your patients with diabetes have uncontrolled diabetes, and then create a list you know, of these patients, go to the community, uh, review the data, provide the services, and then connect uh, patients with, especially through telehealth, um, making sure that the patients have an understanding of the technology and the application that they can use 
to uh, to reduce the uh, A1C, and then um, just to uh, make sure that you have all the um, address the health literacy issues that these patients may have. It's not uh, it's not uh, not only health literacy, but uh, technology issues that they, they may be uh, experiencing. So this is a really uh, good example of how technology is changing how we are serving our patients. And again, you can go to um, healthcareinfo.org uh, and get more information on, on some best practices on how other health centers are using technology to address diabetes uh, 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 and, uh, and specifically provide preventive services. Next slide. So let's go back to our case study. Uh, this is again, Ms. Garcia an 89-year-old widow who has difficulties communicating in English. Uh, she's been living in public housing with one of her granddaughters for the past two years because her family have been unable to cope with her nursing needs following a stroke in 2012, which has affected her right side and her speech. Ms. Garcia is unable to manage the normal activities of daily living, and she was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes 20 years ago. Ms. Garcia had taken a great interest in her diabetes when she was able to, but since having a stroke and the death of her spouse in 2013, she has not been able to participate in her own personal diabetes care. Over time, Ms. Garcia has become increasingly frustrated because she is unable to communicate how she's feeling or what her needs are. And this week, you are going to communicate with uh, your patient virtually via Zoom and you are preparing to make sure you provide an effective diabetes care management and support. So next slide. So a couple of questions. Um, again, you can uh, either type uh, your, your responses or you can uh, uh, unmute yourself and then uh, uh, verbally um, participate in the discussion, but what would you like to know about Ms. Garcia before your virtual visit? So we are, ta we are talking about an 89-year-old patient who may probably have some issues uh, using technology. Uh, she is a patient that is, has limited uh, English proficiency. So in, in advance, you are preparing. This is the first time that you are going to have this communication with your patient. What would you do? What would you like to know before your, your virtual visit? Anyone who would like to? Is she um, documented? Is she a legal citizen of the US? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, that, that's, a great, that's a great point, Jonathan. And, 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 and that's uh, one of the issues that are affecting patients, uh, specifically Hispan the Hispanic population, um, with all these uh, public charge you know, issues. And uh, that's a great that's a great question, you know, just to make sure that you are addressing that and providing, you know, some of uh, referrals to your patients, you know, in case uh, sure. they have some uh, immigration issues. I would like to say, though, that uh, public charge has been suspended in the state of Maryland, as well as it, as well as D.C. and a few other states in the country as of right now. Correct. Correct. But, you know, uh, it is still the stigma. Uh, you know, as, uh, even though it has been uh, uh, canceled, uh, patients still are afraid. Of, some of them are not uh, familiar with, the, with these changes, and they prefer not to go to the clinic or, or have all these conversations, uh, even though, you know, the public uh, charge issue has been suspended. You're, you're totally right on that. Anyone else? All right, and what tips would you give to your patients to prepare for her first virtual visit with you? Uh, we're talking about technology. We're talking about uh, someone with uh, uh, limited English uh, proficiency. Uh, what would you like to, what tips would you offer to your patient? What, what, what would you do to make your conversation with your patient interactive and making sure that the patient receives all the information that you would like to provide to her? 
I will make sure the patient um, um, knows how to work a cell phone, her cell phone. Mm -hmm. Or uh, I will try my best to make sure she understands. She gets the, she, she, to make sure that she gets a translator if she needs to, or uh, as a senior fellow, I would like to make sure that she gets the link, how to join, how to get into her uh, virtual appointment. Thank you, and that's, that's, uh, that's great uh, feedback, uh, Fatima. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's extremely, extremely necessary to making, uh, to make sure that the patient, if, if the patient has any issues understanding English and interacting, whether the health center can offer an interpreter or if one of the, uh, of the daughter, that the, 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 uh, the person that she lives with, you know, in public housing, can be part of the conversation. There are some uh, issues of privacy sometimes that we need to address first. Uh, we've been discussing that some health centers offer some, um, some interpreters, you know, and, and, and there are a couple of things that uh, probably we need to address, but you are totally right, you know, in regards to whether or not the patient can use technology and whether or not Zoom is the best way to communicate with the patient. You know, if the patient is, doesn't have a very good understanding on uh, how to use uh, this technology, uh, you, can, you can also have a, a phone interview, you know, and then provide all, all, all the recommendations and preventive uh, education uh, services that you would like to address. That, that's, that's great. All right, and we received um, a response also from Baliana. Thank you so much, Baliana. Um, she said, use our language line to assist in translation for preparation for visit and during the visit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Meliana. That's, that's great. And it's my understanding, and thank you for that, that uh, some health centers are using these, uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know if I can say that these are like calls in, uh, in house call centers, you know, where you can communicate with your patients. But uh, but then if you don't mind, and if this is not an issue for you, if, if you uh, unmute yourself and, uh, and, 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 and let us know, you know, the, the serve, that the specific service that you are providing to your patients. Probably she's not. She's she doesn't have access to it. But uh, yeah, she's she's right. I mean, some health centers are offering that kind of services. Uh, every time that I talk to a health center in San Diego, California, uh, they uh, they 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 say that they have uh, people from all over the world, and there are over fifteen languages and dialects. You know, that people speak in that community. So what they also have is something similar to what Baliana is mentioning, you know, uh, people on, uh, who are from the community who can uh, uh, be used as translators and making sure that these people are trained before, have, before uh, having any interaction with your patients. But that's, that's another big, big, big uh, 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 issue when you are going to have uh, a virtual visit with a patient, whether or not you have the access or the, whether or not the patient have access to interpreters if they do not have a family member. Um, so, and she provided additional feedback oh, for now. Okay. Um, yeah, she said, I'm having trouble with audio, but we have access to a call center who assists clients in their preferred language. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for that information. And the last one uh, that we have here is what would you do to make your virtual visit interactive? I mean, that you make sure that the patient has receives all the instructions that they need. We've been talking, for instance, about um, some issues with uh, whether or not the patients cannot follow some of the instructions and the issue that sometimes patients are not taking the medications because they do not have um, the, uh, a very good understanding of how they, are, uh, how they need to take their medications. So any, any, 
advice or any tips on what would you do to make your visit interactive with your patient? Okay, um, we received um, a response from Baliana, male information and education in their preferred language before visit. That's an excellent, that's an excellent uh, uh, choice. Um, very good advice just to make sure that the, what you are going to discuss with your patient, uh, the patient can get some printed materials or some written materials in advance. So they, you can discuss it with your patient and ask your patient whether they have any challenges following those instructions. That's, that's great. Thank you so much, Balian. So uh, we are uh, evolving, uh, healthcare and primary care is evolving. Next slide. Um, we are we need to adapt again. Uh, we need to make sure that we have all the information from our patient in advance. And at the same time, we need to learn about new technology. We need to make sure that we are uh, understanding everything that patients are using. So uh, thank you so much for uh, participating. Before uh, you leave, uh, there is a post survey for this session. If you have any additional questions, please make sure that you can, uh, I mean, that, that, that you, um, that you contact us, uh, that is my contact information, that's my email address, and you see Fide's email address as well. If you have any questions, if you have any concerns, or if you need any resources, make uh, please uh, contact us. We'll be happy, really happy to help you. Next slide. So thank you so much. And again, if you have any questions, uh, please make sure that you can contact us. And it's been a pleasure to communicate with all of you, to learn from you, all your best practices and are you're doing to address uh, the healthcare needs of your patient with diabetes. Thank you again uh, for your participation. And if you have any questions, please uh, just uh, send us uh, an email. Uh, it's been such a great honor to, to have you all. And, and thank you for, for being with us and for the uh, great work that you're doing to address the healthcare needs of your populations. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you.